y'all. Luke Merrill, Tin Man 2 Customs here. Today we're gonna go through and do some sheet metal fabrication. Woo! Now some of y'all might know me for some of my hot rod builds I've done in the past. Some of you guys might know me for fabrication videos on YouTube or some of the writing I've done for some magazines over the years, which are usually tech or fabrication based. I'm actually going to start running the uh, Miller Making Metal series as well as writing for the newsletter. So this video is in addition to an article that I wrote for Miller on basically how to control heat and sheet metal. So some of y'all know me, like I said, for those things. But another thing that I do is actually build uh, smoothie running boards for 30s and 40s hot rods. Today we're going to be building some running boards for 39 Chevy. Uh, we start out with a form blank which we have formed um, at a fab shop down the street that has big presses. Um, and then we take that, we'll plasma cut out the right shape, and then we will actually um, shape the ends to sort of flow better with the older 40s vehicles that have more curves and stuff like that. And that's where the welding process will take place. Uh, I got this new Miller Spectrum Extreme 625 plasma cutter. Yeah, I'll just show you basically um, how I have this set up. We have these templates that we've made uh, based on an original running board. And you can see they have the shape of the fender, shape of the edge. So uh, something that we do different on these running boards is we actually shape the end. Uh, a lot of companies, they just leave them straight. And then it goes to your fender and it kind of looks crappy. Uh, so you can see there's a little bit of shape to them. Nothing crazy, but enough to kind of make it look less obtuse or ugly. So right now I'm wearing the uh, typical work attire, the old Crocs and hospital socks. But uh, when I'm welding and cutting... I make sure to wear some closed toe shoes, some pants, obviously all the Miller PPE, and follow all the guidelines on the equipment. As always, always follow all the guidelines. But for comfortable work attire, I highly recommend Crocs and Socks. Oh yeah! So basically all I'm going to do now is just be cutting off this end, and then I'll start shaping. One thing of note, plasma cutting, you usually want a shade 5 lens. Uh, I'd like to wear some just regular, uh, obviously, safety glasses, uh, shade 5. But I got these dang things, prescription. Can't go without them, so I have to rock a face shield here. I uh, just picked this up, part number 288273. I had some older ones, but I figured it was time for a new one since I'm going to be probably using this plasma cutter quite a bit. So Keep watching. Comment below. Like. Subscribe. Now that I got the rough shape cut with the Miller Plasma Cutter, what I do is I just have a Sharpie here and I mark along this radius ridge. You can see where the radius stops right there. Um, so now this is where I'm going to shape the end. So I draw on there with the Sharpie line. I'm just going to take my uh, Milwaukee M12 grinder. This thing is badass. She's a beast. No hoses, no nothing. I'll cut that line all the way through. And then I marked where the radius or where the bend starts on this piece. Um, and then I'm just going to slice, you know, every three-eighths of an inch or so, and that uh, will basically allow me to bend this edge around. So I have the general shape cut there, and then I cut the relief cuts there, and I'm basically starting to hammer that around on this side here. Uh, you can see I'm using a heel dolly, a regular body hammer. Throwing the heel dolly up in here, it's a perfect height for... Uh, this here you can see basically I'm using a hammer off dolly technique so I'm holding the dolly here and I'm hitting on this side of the dolly and then basically shaping it around the dolly and I'll match up with this profile and weld it up get them hammered around to the shape and now I can start welding them up now when you weld material, throw an extreme heat at it. Uh, that extreme heat will basically shock the atoms or molecules in the material and make them move around faster. Now that is true for any sort of aluminum, steel, anything like that. Um, some materials are more reactive to it than others. And then as that weld cools, you're going to have the atoms are actually going to like freeze and shrink up. So they'll go into like a state of stress 
and it'll shrink the material. Uh, now again, that happens on an atomic level. There's nothing you can really do about it uh, other than try and plan for it and fix it afterwards. Another basic example of this shrinking concept that I talked about is actually heating up a nut. Um, so a lot of us have worked on cars and uh, you have a rusty nut and bolt and the bolt or nut just won't come off. So you take a torch, you heat up the nut, and the nut actually expands, which allows the nut to come off easier. So that's a simplified example that most of us are familiar with when it comes to uh, working with anything metal. Uh, if you heat it up, it'll change in size, and sometimes it benefits us, sometimes it doesn't. So now I'm just using my Multimatic 220AC-DC, uh, 24 wire. I have this set on the auto set for 16 gauge. Uh, usually these are pretty accurate. Um, I've never really had to adjust them much, but some people prefer, uh, you know, more volts or less wire, vice versa or whatever. So I just rock it on the auto set for the MIG for the first little bit here uh, to get it all tacked into place because it's easier to uh, tack it into place with the MIG when you're holding this. <clears throat> so you kind of got to hold it so it's lined up right. See that little bit of tension there. Now a lot of people struggle with welding sheet metal. You know, it's a little bit more finesse than welding thicker material. It will uh, basically shrink. And on thin material like sheet metal, it's a lot more noticeable because the uh, material isn't as forgiving. Now there's also some shapes of material that will shrink more or less depending on, you know, the size, uh, if there's any bracing on that material anywhere, and things like that. Now shrinking from the weld is something that you really can't stop. Um, you can control it in a way that limits it. Um, you can plan for it, or you can fix it afterwards. Tricks. Now in general the best practice is to use the lowest amount of amps or volts possible. Uh, every thickness is going to require a certain amount of volts and amps. What I suggest doing is taking a piece of test material, same thickness and size and welding position that you're going to be working on and then make a few different attempts at welds and look at the backside for some penetration and see how the penetration looks. Now you want just enough penetration to fill the gaps, but you don't want so much penetration that there's there's little nubbies off the back and stuff hanging there. Back, back to the, to the video. video. A sphere is geometrically the strongest shape you can have. So any for, sort of a formed radius edge or formed round piece is usually more strong than a straight piece. If you look at like Roman archways and stuff back in the old days, they're always a a half circle because that's geometrically the strongest shape. That applies to welding uh, and working with sheet metal as well. So on this radius formed edge here, this is actually uh, not very susceptible to warping. So I'm going to MIG weld this up because easier, it's faster, there's a bigger gap from the cutting. So this MIG welding will fill that gap with less heat than TIG welding actually will. So you can see I did a few beads there. I'm kind of bouncing back and forth from one side to the other, let it cool a little bit and then come back and hit it. Now you can clamp an aluminum heat sink to the flange here. I just don't because I know it's going to shrink anyway, so I might as well just hammer it out afterwards a little bit. Um, when you weld, stuff will shrink, so this edge right here will just shrink. It'll just pucker down a little bit. All i got to do is hit it back out with a hammer and a dolly. Stretch it back out. Then once this top side's all, or all these face welds are done, I will weld these relief cuts down here. Uh, after I dolly, hammer and dolly all this face so it's all nice and straight and smooth. It's pretty decent right now, but you can see there's a little bit of wiggle in there that'll come out with the hammer and dolly. And then I'll take and I'll TIG weld up the top here. You can see that's nice and tight. Um, it's a little looser up here because there's not much shape out here. If you look in here, that's a cutoff wheel thickness, so it's just easier to make that up. Uh, you actually get less heat in the panel when you MIG weld it. So my favorite part about having this welder is actually being able to switch from MIG to TIG on the fly. So obviously, I just MIG welded all this up. So I don't even have to get out of my chair. I can just grab my torch and uh, hit her. So the two basic welding processes that we're going to talk about are MIG welding and TIG welding now. Gas welding is very similar to TIG welding in nature and pros and cons, but we're just going to go through the basic simple pros and cons of each MIG welding and TIG welding because they're the most commonly used. If you want to pause the video, you can look at some of these pros and cons. So the general rule that I always use is if you have time, TIG it. If you don't have time, MIG it. Either process will work. Pretty fair for basically any project you're working on, um, but sometimes TIG is required, sometimes MIG is just easier. Now we're looking at the welds on the back side of this running board. You can see there's pretty good penetration in most spots, but I like to go and fuse all this stuff back up on the back side just to make sure she ain't gonna crack. Woo! Fun, fun! So now that the boards are all welded up, uh, we'll actually take Milwaukee M18 grinder with an Empire Abrasives 40 grit flap wheel on it and uh, we'll go ahead and knock down the largest majority of the welds. What's nice about these cordless tools is not only that they're cordless, but they actually don't spin as fast as their corded counterparts. So you have less chance of getting excessive heat in your welded panel that you're grinding down because it just simply doesn't spin as fast so there's less friction. 
And then once I have all the grinding done, I will just go ahead and I'll take a cheap DA with an 80 grit pad on it, 80 grit the whole thing. Now you can see we ground down all those ends, uh, stretch this little low spot back out because when you weld, uh, it's going to shrink right in here. So we just stretch that back out, basically flatten it back out so it's perfectly smooth and straight. You can see I got a whole stack of different ones cut and ready to start working. This one's a pain in the here. See how tight that radius is? That one sucks, but it works. Yeah. Um, so if you guys like this, give it a like, give it a subscribe, or if you got any questions, post them in the comments below, and I will personally go and answer those. I'd love to help you guys. Um, I like to try and grow the community and pass on the little bit of knowledge I do have to the people that might not know or might want to learn something. So, like I said, comment below. Don't be shy. Keep on keeping on. Woo! Today, we're going to go through a little project on building some running boards out of some metal. Yeah! That sounds like some white chicks stuff. <laughs> Who remembers the movie White Chicks? That's a great movie. Great movie. Oh, you want to talk about We're going to give you a little project today. So, some of you... Why can I not talk today? For some of my fabrication based YouTube videos uh, where a lot of them are tutorial or... So like I said, comment below if you got any questions. I don't mind. Yeehaw! <laughs> Love to answer your questions though. Mm, ciao ciao for now.